more than 90 years, St. Cloud State Hockey has had a home in the Granite City. Boasting two Hockey Hall of Famers in Frank Brimsek and the late Herb Brooks, many players and coaches have made their mark on St. Cloud State hockey lore. With former St. Cloud State greats like Mark Parrish and Brett Hedekin, to more recent standouts like Jack Ashan and Jimmy Schultz, two Patty Kazmaier Award finalists and 16 Division I All-Americans have paved the way for current St. Cloud State men's and women's teams to continue the Huskies hockey tradition. This week's guest is one of many who have made their mark on St. Cloud State hockey history as the Huskies Warming House podcast presents this week's Healthy Scratch interview segment. Welcome back to the Den Huskies Warming House podcast fans. Episode number 53 on our Tuesday morning here, the Healthy Scratch interview segment. It is a spring break for me, not so much so for Nick Maxson back in action with whatever he's got going on. Uh, but someone who's got a little bit of downtime, although I don't think coaches ever really actually have downtime, is our guest this week in Steve McDonald, head coach of the women's hockey team, coming off a 6-12-1 season, uh, just missing that fifth place spot in the WCHA. Nick, uh, this is uh, the second time we've had Steve on the show, and uh, uh, not to say that, you know, you never know what you're going to get with Steve, but I would say this is probably the most jovial and open that we've seen Steve uh, uh, this time around. I think so. You know, it's one of those deals where you get yourself in front of the camera a couple of different times and you start to relax a little bit and uh, some really good uh, stories, I would say, for, especially from uh, uh, north of the border, even though it's close to what's a goofy, you know, uh, American patriots, if you want to call it that. But uh, uh, Steve McDonald, yeah, just overall great dude. Uh, again, uh, looking forward to, some, uh, to you guys hearing some of the stories that he has to tell. I think uh, fans are going to be interested to see some of his background uh, that he's had and some of the phone calls he's had as well. Yeah, and a lot to look forward to when we break down uh, this women's hockey season and talk about what's coming up uh, next year. And Steve will have all that and more, like Nick mentioned, episode number 53 of the Healthy Scratch interview segment. And welcome to this week's Healthy Scratch interview segment. And joining us this time is current women's head coach Steve McDonald. Steve, thank you for joining us and happy afternoon to you. As always, guys, happy to be on. Always a pleasure to chat with you guys. Yeah, happy to have you here, Steve. Uh, you are repeat guest number six, in case you were curious. I, hey. I, I'm i glad that we finally started recording uh, just after noon here, considering we pretty much ran an entire show before we started recording here. So uh, um, most of it was uh, uh, not so colorful, but some colorful fun off the air. Uh, but one thing that uh, has been colorful in the hockey world this past week, as far as women's hockey is concerned, uh, garnering uh, a little bit of attention for the women's game in any way, shape or form, uh, is the fact that uh, the WCHA was mixed up in some people thinking the Minnesota Golden Gophers at number four in the WCHA might have gotten snubbed here for the national tournament. I, uh, from your perspective, uh, having played the Gophers three times this year, uh, and knowing a little bit about how that tournament process works, I, I mean, what would be your opinion about uh, kind of the number four team in the WCHA and the Gophers missing the tournament for the first time since 2007? I would put maybe the single caveat to this. I, uh, you could argue maybe whether or not the Gophers should have made the tournament. Uh, but I guess the better question is. Uh, is it really right to take it away from a team like Duluth that maybe had a really good season uh, in our opinion this year? Yeah. You know, the, uh, the, the national tournament uh, is always uh, garners speculation on there's always a team that you can argue should have been in uh, based on whatever rationale that uh, you know, that attracts you to that, to that conversation, you know, but uh, in that, that's the reality of our league is there's just so many good teams in our league that inevitably there's sometimes a, every year there's a team from our league that, that might be left out that we feel might be better. And when I say we, we as a league um, feel might be better than, than a team uh, out East, you know, uh, but unfortunately that's not how the selection goes. And there is, uh, there is some subjectivity to it at, at times, you know, in terms of looking at some different pieces in terms of whether it be strength and schedule. And, and then now this year, they're just presented a whole nother level of challenges with no crossover. You know, when there's no crossover in between leagues, you didn't have that opportunity to to be able to compare strength of schedules in between leagues. And and that's just a reality of COVID. And and that, you know, it was talked about, I, I guess, at the end of last summer, you know, and uh, that was, OK, what's it going to look like? How's that going to what are those discussions and, and what, what are those going to be look like? And, you know, not take not take anything away from Duluth. Uh, Duluth is a very good team. We, we had our problems with them. We had our struggles with them this year. You know, uh, they're, they're a very good team and 
Uh, they have some really high end players in that team. And, uh, you know, and sometimes it comes down to what teams you're able to have success against. And Duluth had showed that they had success against Wisconsin and maybe Minnesota struggled a little bit more against Wisconsin this year. And that might've played a large role in it. Sometimes that happens, you know, and uh, I think Minnesota is very, I think they're definitely within the top eight in the country, you know, uh, but unfortunately that sometimes uh, it doesn't work out. So unfortunately for them. So uh, I, 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 I'm sure that uh, you'll see them put a, a nice push on next year. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure you'll see them there again next year, but um, yeah, you know, it's always unfortunate. We want to see as many teams from our league in there as possible every single year, you know? So like I said, it's uh, inevitably sometimes there's one team from our league that, that uh, is on the outside looking in. And, and unfortunately this year it's the Gophers. Steve, you know, this similar conversation, you know, we were having this about women's, but at the end of the day, this almost exact same conversation is almost primed to happen on the men's side here in a couple of weeks as well. So, you know, everything you've discussed in terms of, you know, how normally the RPI or the pairwise, you know, factors into this, we're probably going to have a similar conversation, whether it's the NCAC, Hockey East, ECAC. I mean, someone is going to be feeling like they're getting snubbed. I guess, you know, if, if you're in that position, uh, I guess, you know, do you write it off as COVID or I guess, how would you make if you feel like you should be in the tournament and you're instead sitting on the sidelines? Yeah, that's a really good question. Cause it's going to be, and that's why, you know, finishing as high in your league as possible in the regular season goes a long way, you know, and I think that's why our, our men, you know, and how they were able to perform. And I guess it would have been Saturday, you know, and the OT win, um, that that is huge, huge for them, you know, because it changes that conversation being able to finish second versus third uh, within your league. And when you get into the, some of those subjective conversations, and usually in the men's side, it's a little bit more, um, you know, it's like, hey, here's the 16 RPI, that's it, cut it off there. If you can get in, great, and you know, and, and you know, so sometimes it's a little bit more. Uh, black and white or cut and dry, I should say, on the men's side of that. But again, this year with COVID, it's going to, there's going to be some conversations because there's no crossover. But then also, we didn't really mention this with on the women's side, but they're both, you know, the same conversation as the unbalanced schedules. You know, like uh, Duluth played a different schedule than, than Minnesota. It's it, n- n- nothing's the same, you know, Wisconsin played a different schedule than, than we played, you know, and uh, so uh, that's why there's so much subjectivity in, in it. And I, there's, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if there's going to be some teams that feel as though they're getting the, the snub, if you will, uh, for, from this year and, and uh, on, the, on the men's side. And it's going to be extremely difficult, you know. And uh, so even talking selfishly for our men's team, that's why I was so happy for them to see them get that win on Saturday because that's going to help really help in those conversations. So it, it's a COVID year, you know, like you said, you just write it up to COVID. And, but it's just one of those things that, that you can't control. We can't control those conversations. And you can only do what you can do. And again, thankfully our men, <laughs> they're able to take care of business on Saturday. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how those things come together. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the coaching decisions that go into that too. Scott Sandlin as well. Some of us thought maybe he might try to pull the goaltender uh, in a tie game at the end of the third period. And you think about uh, how differently the script might flip for Duluth uh, as far as the national tournament is concerned, uh, you know, maybe grabbing that extra point in overtime for them. So as you mentioned, St. Cloud State, uh, as far as the NCHC playoffs are concerned with COVID, and as far as the NCAA tournament, second place in the NCHC is not a bad place to be for this Huskies team, especially a group that... Uh, Maybe we expected at the beginning of the year to maybe not be uh, higher than, you know, third or fourth in that league. Um, Moving over to the women's side, St. Cloud State finishing sixth in the conference, 19 games played, six wins, 12 losses, and one tie on the season, just under 19 points and a 325 win percentage. It's actually the first time uh, the women's team has been over 300 since I believe 2015, 16, uh, if my math serves me correct. Uh, one of the, one of the things that Nick and I talked about extensively throughout your season, Steve, uh, is the ability to have success and start that train rolling with teams that are in that bottom tier of the league, uh, specifically uh, kind of your Bemidji States, your Mankatos, you know, even potentially who's ever in that four spot, you know, starting to build success there uh, six, three and one versus Bemidji and Mankato respectively this year. Four one and one in Bemidji and a two and two split against Mankato. Um, what did you notice from this group that even though they might not have finished as high up as they were hoping in the standings, uh, what trends did you see that were different uh, from last year's group that went two and twenty one? 
Well, lots of lessons learned. When you go two and 21, you learn a lot of lessons, coaches and players and everybody, you know? So uh, do you want to go through that? No, but you know, but, but you have to take those lessons and that's something we talk about every, every single day, sometimes with our team, you know, and you know, we're, like I said, we are really proud of our team in terms of things that we were able to do. You know, uh, we think we could have, well, we were one point away from finishing in fifth, you know, so talk about, you know, the thinking about pulling a goalie Friday in Bemidji, that trust me, that crossed my mind, a, a tie game, you know, we needed to win in regulation to be able to go ahead into fifth, you know, so trust me, did we do it? No, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, th- those things cross your mind. No question about it. When I'm thinking back to my high school days, you know, coaching in like a, in a tournament where you pull a goalie in the, in the third period, even though it's tied because you need a win, you know, and so we had the ability to, to finish fifth when everybody, everybody in the league picked us to finish seventh in, in the basement of the league. And, and we had that opportunity and, and that's in the last weekend of the year. And, you know, uh, and I, I think that we even probably let, I would say, uh, probably seven points get away from us, six, seven points get away from us, you know, a tie against Wisconsin. There's some unfortunate things happened in that last minute 40, you know, um, we had a tie there. We were up on the Gophers going in a third and then Grace Elmwinkle decided to score two goals, you know, uh, so which she does so well. Uh, and uh, then, you know, there's a couple of games against Mankato, which, you know, like you said, we, we split the season series with them. We believe we, we could have won easily one of those and won that season series three, one, if you, if you will. And, and then with Bemidji, there's some over, there's a few overtimes in there. Right. So um, we, we think we, we could have been clearly into fifth place. So in terms of what we liked with our team is just how resilient we, we were the, this season, you know, and I'll use that Wisconsin weekend as an example, nobody likes to talk about a big loss, but I will, because when you learn from it and it makes it better on Saturday, yeah, I'll talk about it because of how so proud of a lot of teams. So easy for them to just kind of roll over and not come back and compete. And then Saturday we come back and we competed. It's not like Wisconsin just rolled over. They were playing, you know, like he was playing as top guy, top girls and he was playing them, you know, and we were going toe to toe. And like I said, unfortunately, we were, we were close to, to that tie and didn't quite work out. But so, Really, really happy with our team with how we res- resilient they were throughout the year. Uh, and then go back to that Mankato series, you know, the first one of the year after having our first weekend canceled, we come back and we have, we, I think we had three lines. We, I think we had 10 forwards, you know, I think it was 10 or 11, you know, and uh, so you had that, you had players out of the lineup, you had freshmen being thrown into situations in their first collegiate weekend, you know, so I could go on and it's a long answer, but it's just, you know, when you're proud of your team, you just want to make sure that you talk about it and give them props with that. But, you know, it was just, uh, they were just so resilient this year. And like I said, we finished already higher than everybody thought we were. And we think we could even finish higher. Uh, Steve, I, I want to kind of play off that a little bit just because, I mean, I was uh, in the building watching that Wisconsin series and yeah, that Friday night game, what I mean, certainly, you know, from a fan perspective, you know, it's tough to watch that, but Saturday, you know, when you talk about responding, right. You, you know, even talking goaltender specifically, but as a team, when you respond from, you know, essentially getting kicked down like they did and, you know, take away one turnover behind your own net that in game could have easily gone to overtime. And, you know, from my perspective, I thought that you guys had a couple of really good grade A chances that you could have actually pulled that one out, but going back to the schedule, cause you mentioned it a little bit with getting the first game canceled. You had a month up between essentially the first half and second half of the season between essentially winter break, a couple cancellations there when you're lacking consistency. I mean, no question that for, I just, for an athlete's perspective, that hurts at least, you know, keeping those train tracks rolling as you're getting better, um, you know, not to put the crystal ball in front of you for next season, because there are some indications that likely this type of season is going to be a one and done, hopefully. Right. Um, but how can you build on this momentum that you've had, even though you've had to, you know, not only just juggle so much with the roster and with COVID and everything, but doesn't it give you some hope for next season that you're taking not only one step now, but it might be easier to take another step next year to try to even compete for that top four, maybe even top three spot in the WCHA. Well, yeah, you know, and, and that's, that's what it's, it's exciting. You know, at the end of the year, we were playing for something, you know, we were playing to get into that fifth spot and uh, which who knows that might've, my things might've happened. We might've even been able to sneak into the playoff scenario, you know, 
Um, but that that's all you ask for is to be able to play for something at, at the end of the year and whatever that is, you, you, you just, you ask to be able to be playing for something, you know, and whether that's playing for the first spot or whether that's getting into the fifth or fourth spot, you know, so, you know, and actually going back to that Wisconsin, yeah, there was a trip behind our net, but there was a trip at the blue line where if that didn't happen, that pucks at the other, uh, other end of the ice on our leading score stick at the moment. Right. So you need a new one. So, uh, so yeah, there's like three things that happen uh, in, in that scenario that's just you know, like, really, <laughs> you know, the trip there, then the trip behind and then the, even the puck, how it bounced to end up on Eden's stick. You're just like, really, you know, so that's hockey though. That's the game, you know? So you look at back at that and it's just, it, you know, like you said, building off of the excitement for, for next year, when winning three of your last four. And I think we could have won all four of those, you know, and I think there's that Saturday, uh, game against uh, Mankato got away from us a little bit. Um, and, uh, but in that, that's going to happen sometimes in, in, in a season, but the, I think the way we continue to build off of it is exactly that, you know, they, they're having three weeks off right now and they're going to come back and we're going to get training o- right away again, you know? So it's not like we have to completely sit and wait until September next year to really start pushing, you know, making strides, but you know, the, they'll come back here in another week and a half and, and we'll get training. You know, and then that spring training is a big, big piece to it. So I think that's how we build on it. And then just really continuing conversations that we've had. Obviously, they change a little bit, you know, with with some seniors graduating and moving on. Uh, and also voices change, dynamics change just slightly. But we were so proud of our locker room. It was just so solid uh, that we just, you just feel, you just know that it's going to carry over. You know, you just know it's going to carry over um, and in, into next year. So uh, I think that's exactly how you do it. Yeah, you, you, you look to that and it's like, all right, getting to work on March 22nd, you know, and you get right back after it. So um, as simple as that, there's, again, there's nothing else other than that, just dealing with what's in front of us and spring training is the next thing that's in front of us. Steve, speaking of that consistency piece, uh, there's a couple of variables that come into play here. Number one, consistency consistency, uh, is great for goaltenders, and I want to touch on them a little bit, but you also mentioned uh, the seniors. We had Emma Paluzny on uh, at the tail end of 2020 and kind of asked her that NCAA eligibility question. Do you feel like having that super senior year uh, and coming back? uh, um, One, do you have any inkling of any players that might want to return for another year in a Huskies uniform? And number two, with goaltender specific, Emma Paluzny finishes with a 919 save percentage, and Sonia Hola as the freshman, a 918 save percentage with a couple of shutouts. I uh, how um how I should say optimistic are you for your goaltending situation, regardless of if Emma comes back or not? And do you see Emma Paluzny and other seniors coming back on top of that? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, won't, won't let the cat out of the bag yet with, with some of the ones that have, are deciding to come back and deciding to move on. You know, you, you guys have probably heard, you know, through the grapevine, a few of them, but, you know, just out of respect for our conversations with them, you know, just continue those, but have a pretty good idea about who is, is wants to come back and continue and take advantage of that extra year and, and who are, who's ready to move on uh, to other things in, the, in their life plan. And, you know, we'll, we'll release that, uh, you know, after some of those conversations. Um, but so we have a pretty good idea of what that looks like. Uh, but talking about Emma, you know, and, uh, and Sonny and Carly, because, you know, that goaltending trio is, uh, is phenomenal, you know, in terms of you don't often see this, you know, and we've seen it before and we're just to see it again, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> really you know like when you had janine and you had emma and then you know when you had uh even janine uh, you know fitzgerald and and uh and janine and it's just there's there's just so much uh positives that, that, that you see with with players and what they're able to do and um it, in the goaltending and if you have two really capable goalies that are playing at a really really high level and and like i said with uh you know with the, as a goaltender trio it's just uh uh you know carly i think you know you, you can't underestimate what she does for the team and but then also that goaltender trio in terms of how, how much she helps and she's that player that no matter what you want in that locker room you know is uh, and, she, and she's one of those players so yeah, really, really blessed with the goaltender a group that we have. And, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if it continues to be the same next year. 
All right, that's that's some good recruiting, I would say, Steve. Right, just uh, really bringing in some good freshman talent. Uh, one that pitches a shutout in Sonny Hole in our first game uh, in a, in the collegiate world as well. I want to move over to uh, a couple of players here because I know you love player questions, right, Steve? Or uh, um, teaching you how to dodge player questions. But one player that um, uh, I, I wouldn't say maybe took a stride, but really was kind of back in full form, if you will. And it will kind of play off of a couple of questions I have later. And it revolves around the sophomore slump, if you will. Um, and one player that we're going to touch on is your leading scorer. You need a Newland, seven goals, five assists for 12 points on the year and 19 games played. Uh, she had 13 points in 30 uh, last year, uh, one shy of her point total in uh, 11 less games played. I, and that was her sophomore year last year. I, is there something to be said for the sophomore slump? I, you know, and I touch on players like Taylor Lind really grew from her freshman year in her point total, but you look at players like Clara Hamlerova and Olivia Savar who had kind of those breakout freshman years and didn't have a bad sophomore year, but maybe just weren't getting the balances of the production that uh, you were looking for. You saw Ina Newland jump out of that this year in her junior year and start to produce again. Uh, what can you say about that sophomore slump and the mentality of those players that maybe had that success early on in their career and what you say to players like Clara Hamlerova, Olivia Savar, who are still in the top five or six in terms of points, but maybe are kind of thinking about what can I do this off season to get back to that form that you need a Newland was able to find in that junior year. What a heck of a question that was, Steve. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's, and I'm happy you bring up uh, Nina's, uh, you know, uh, you, you Nina, she's, uh, she's one that, you know, met with her. She's back in Finland now, you know, so she flew back. She's in Finland at, at, as we speak, uh, got the confirmation text from her, like made it safe. Yes. And that was it. Uh, so that's Nina's, but uh, you know, she's one that really, she, she described it, you know, uh, really kind of started to find her way, you know, and sometimes it takes the players a couple of years and, you know, freshman year, there's no expectations, you know, you just kind of play, you know, it's like, I'm a freshman, no expectations. I'm just going to play Coach has put me out there. Right. I'm going to play, you know, and um, yeah, I don't know if I always agree with a sophomore slump. I think people read into it more than, than is needed, you know, um, and uh, so not to jump ahead of Neeners, but going to Himla, Himla, yeah, you know, she might have wanted to score a few more goals, but she didn't have a sophomore slump. Uh, you know, she played in every single critical situation for us, you know, so she penalty killed. So there's some nights she was playing 24 minutes a night. That's not a sophomore slump, you know, and when, when, when you have a team that triples their win total in conference from last year, you know, and uh, so she, she, and she played center, she played wing, she was all, she played everywhere. She played five on three situations offensively and defensively. She probably blocked the most shots out of our whole team, you know, so I think the sophomore slump can sometimes be too uh, dictated by points and, and I get it, you know, like goal scorers want to score. You know, so they, they look at those points and, and that's where, you know, Savar, she's a goal scorer and she wants to score a goal. So she's going to view it, you know, where she maybe she didn't have as quite of a, of a productive year and um, than others. Which again, she was put in a lot of a lot of difficult situations this year offensively as well. And I think also when it's so very inconsistent, I, I think sometimes offensive players you know, they, they like that consistency. You score a goal, you get that monkey, you're, you're going and you you're feeling it. It doesn't matter who you're playing. You're going to be scoring that goal. And I think some players really feed off that consistency. And, you know, and I think that's where non-conference games also re really help out. Right. Cause it's something different, something new. You're playing a different team. You're playing a different, you know, opponent, different rank. And, and uh, there's a different novelty to it. And uh, we match up well against some non-conference opponents and allows those players to get that rhythm you know, and sometimes when, you know, versus going Minnesota, Wisconsin, boom, boom, you know, back to back where, yeah, you know, like we put ourselves in a position to win those games, you know, so, uh, but still they're, they're top end talent. Like we talked about, uh, about at the beginning of the show, but, you know, so uh, I guess going back to those, those three individuals, you know, Nina's, uh, she just really f started to find her way and she adjusted a few things with her game and there's really starting to click and, you know, her, her physical side of her game as well. She really took a step uh, in, in, in that and that's just her personal commitment and she's always been committed, but sometimes it's a small little tweak, you know, and it really helps. So she, she really took a step and, you know, um, I think with, with Himla, yeah, I wouldn't consider it a sophomore slump, you know, it's like she, yeah, she played every single difficult situation for us this year and it never complained. And 
Uh, she, uh, she was very integral for, uh, for us having a, a, you know, a, a better season improvement on last year with a younger team than we had last year. Right. So, um, we have 52% underclassmen, I think it was, or something like that. 54. I know you guys are stats guys. Uh, but yeah. And then, you know, so, and again, the, that, that's where I think Samar, I, you know, I think she, she's a player that when it gets back to consistency and I think, I think you're really going to see her really take a, take a significant step again, you know, cause she has that ability to do that. Steve, you know, just as much as players, and this would be actually a good transition, um, you know, into maybe who else wants to take maybe a step forward is we talk about players, but, you know, we also want to touch on, you know, yourself as the head coach too, because, you know, what we should have done and for, for the viewers out there, we had a probably about a half hour conversation mm -hmm. that we should have recorded. And what could, we could have called it Husky warming house after dark. It was that good. Mm -hmm. um, but you brought up Steve, you know, the, the coaching community more say, and you had a pretty good story about uh, a former NHL coach, someone that's very connected to Hockey Canada. Um, you know, and I'll just give it away. Former Blues head coach Ken Hitchcock. I want you to talk about, you know, your conversation with him and how you as a coach are even trying to get yourself better um, every single season. I think every coach at every level is always trying to look for ways to improve themselves. And, you know, like even reading some of Mike Babcock stuff, you know, it's just like, you're always learning, always developing, always pushing yourself. What's that next level, you know? And, uh, and obviously after a year, like last year, being a first year head coach and, and that year, you're like, okay, <laughs> what, 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 what do I need to learn? What do I need to get better at? You know, being in the league 10, 10 years, but then also like this was my 20th year coaching. I think this is my 20th year. You know, so it's like, okay, what were all those lessons, but not just relying on those is like, how can you continue to get better? And, you know, so, uh, so you start looking at things, you know, I had a great mentor when I was at Duluth with Shannon Miller, you know, in terms of you know, what were the things I learned from her, which was a lot, you know, and, and Laura Schuler, you know, who was my, my fellow assistant coach at that time, who I, who really mentored me and she's, she's helped guide me as well. So you reach out to coaches like that and, and, you know, the NHL was putting on some coach uh, webinars, you know, and one that I, that I listened to was, was Ken Hitchcock's, what I, I thought was just excellent. So I would emailed the organizer, seeing if I could get those notes. And she goes, sure, Ken will call you next tomorrow or something like that. So he emails me right away. He goes, great, Steve, I'll call you at 10 a.m. tomorrow. You know, and I was like, okay, Ken Hitchcock is calling me. All right. So Ken, he calls and then we just go through and it was just, you know, like, I think, I think, you know, I told you in the story, it's like right away, he goes, okay, what do you want to know? So I started asking him questions. Like, you got a pen and paper? I'm like, yep, got a pen and paper, you know, just start scribbling things down and write as much as you can. And, you know, and he even wanted to know about our team and he was asking questions and, you know, it's just, that's a coaching community, you know, and um, not going to lie, Canadian, Canadian, you know, that, that always helps, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, like you just, you know, another one that's been influential to me is Andy Murray at Western. You know, he's a Manitoban. He's a guy that, you know, uh, really helped me throughout my whole career. Even when I was a tiny, tiny little young pup, you know, and I walk up to Andy Murray and, and I, you know, and can I call you? He goes, yeah, sure. Call me. I answer any number 204, which is the Manitoba area code. So <laughs> what do you know? He answers it, you know? So that's a coaching community. I think what's so, um, so it's so amazing about it is that people are willing to share information, you know, not everybody is, but you find those people and, and you build that trust and then they're willing to share that, you know, like I said, Andy Murray, when he was in St. Louis flew down and hung out with him for four or five days. And, and he goes, there's, there's the binders over there, copy, whatever you want. That's our team systems. There you go. You know? And, uh, so that's what I did, you know, and same thing with Shannon Miller, uh, you know, she goes, here's all of our practices we did. This is what I did. Here you go. She's, she was phenomenal. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a young head coach. I'm not going to lie, you know, second year in the league as a head coach, I've been a head coach before at different levels, but WCHA is a completely different level. So you just want to continue to learn. And Brad Frost has been phenomenal to me as well. And in terms of helping me through and Mark Johnson, you know, those guys are just, uh, just fantastic. So I could go on and on about the coaching community and it starts with St. Cloud, you know, Larson and Oliver and Shyak there. <laughs> I don't know how many times I walk, what was that drill you guys did yesterday? You know, and he's okay, here and break out the board and you're drawing on it and you're just, yeah, you know, having, and then be able to sit with Janelle and Molly. It's, it, you know, all the conversations we have and the stuff up we come up with, it's, you start with one idea and you all end up all the way over here. And this idea you hope is better. And it all usually ends up being better, you know, and it's just like, oh my goodness, it's just the knowledge. So 
you know, wanting to learn and, and uh, wanting to continue to get better is just so critical in any profession. You know, that's why I love the coaching world is there's people, Ken Hitchcock, you know, calls you, <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> you know, and it's just great. So um, you're just blessed to be able to have those opportunities. You had me lost at pen and paper though, Steve. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm too young <laughs> for that. <laughs> always, we, uh, always. Shoot. Noah, should we, I think we need to ask you just to follow up because you had another phone call uh, from a former NHL flame yes, great that most people would know. Talk us about your phone call with Theron Fleury, please, because that was a great story we had before we started recording. Yeah, I haven't been able to connect with him quite yet. We haven't been able to connect. It's just a little bit of a back and forth because, again, you just, there's, the hockey world is so small. It's such a small world. And, you know, there's a, you know, there's somebody in town here that's super supportive of the, of the Huskies and he's, you know, he always helps us out and he, he's, he works at the games and all this and, you know, and he's, he's an excellent supporter of, of, of both men's and women's team. And he's like, okay, I have this, I have this friend who is a former NHL or that has this, uh, has this this app, you know, that, that he uses, I uses, that it's fantastic. And uh, you just want you to learn more about it, you know? So I call and I talk with him, not, not with Theo yet, but talk with him, learn more about the app. And I'm doing a little bit of research because again, you want to find any resource you can to help your athletes, you know? And uh, so it was, all right, I'm going to give you Theo's number. Here's Theo's number. I'm like, okay, here's Theo Fleury's number. This guy idolized when growing up. Like you just, idolize this guy and uh he goes can i give theo your number i'm like sure you know so he gives theo my number and he goes just to warn you he's probably gonna call you in a day or so or text you and let alone he does you know now he, we haven't been able to connect yet you know and uh but it's again it's just it's the hockey world it's just you, you just it's, it's so supportive and everybody just wants to find ways to help each other and uh you know so it's it's, it's something like i said it's just kind of a connection through to uh, this app, this wellness app that, that uh, both of them use and uh, they have really good reviews on. So it's just seen it's something that, that we can expose even myself, but our players. So uh, that's coming down the road, but again, the hockey world, it's just, you, you have to love it. I love the, uh, the throwback to uh, the late eighties, early nineties, uh, Canadian hockey as well. Uh, we're just lucky if we can get the championship game of the world juniors on TV here in the States. Uh, <laughs> But uh, speaking of Canada, Steve, uh, if you could, for our, um, our video viewers here, could you take a lean to your left or to your right? Can you explain the jersey that you have in the background here? Because that is one sexy uniform, if I do say so myself. And uh, one of the players that might have significance on that. Yeah, that is not a Michigan jersey. For all Americans, that is not a Michigan jersey. I always have to clarify that. But that is a Team Manitoba jersey, uh, 2007 Canada Winter Games up from uh, Whitehorse. And, uh, you know, there's obviously a ton of great um, players on that uh, that had great careers in the WHL, most of them that time in major junior. Um, and uh, one player on the Travis uh, Hamanick, who's a phenomenal individual, uh, you know, and he, he was he, he was a player that maybe at that point maybe wasn't as big of a name as some other players, on, you know, on, on that jersey and on the roster at the time. And, you know, he's just a special, such a special individual. He's really carved out a significant career for himself uh, in the NHL and still to this day, you know, and he's, he, you know, and what he does in the community as well is just uh, absolute amazing. So yeah, no, I was, I was the water boy, what water boy, skate sharpener equipment, kind of the catch all guy for, uh, for that, uh, for, for that team. And I was, it was such a special, we made it, we made it to the final. We lost, I think it was six, four in the gold medal game. David Taves, so Jonathan Taves' younger brother was on our team at that point. I believe he got two goals in that game. But see if I can see if I can remember uh, the lineup. So we played against Ontario, who's like the powerhouse. So I believe, see if I can remember. Uh, Del, Delzato, Petrangelo, those are the two D that started. Average. Right. Uh, <laughs> Stamkos, uh, Cody Hodgson, who I, I think he still plays. And... Um, uh, I can't, I can't remember the last, he was another first rounder. See if I, it's, it's awful. I don't remember that, but you line up against Stamkos and you're just like, that's who we're playing against, you know? And it was just, it was a phenomenal game. And I was, again, I'm the water boy sent over, standing over the corner, just watching, learning. And, and uh, it's just, and then to see all those, those guys go on and do what they did in, in their career is just amazing. But uh, yeah, that was a gold medal game. That was, that was I, it was such a special moment to be a part of, but yeah, Manitoba, not Michigan, Jersey, Manitoba, Jersey. 
You talked about uh, Travis Hamannick. We talked a little bit about guys like, uh, you know, Ryan Reeves in the pre-show. Guys that have a little bit more of a, um, a presence uh, outside the world of hockey. Obviously, Travis Hamannick's presence outside the world of hockey and his foundation is a little bit more somber in nature. Uh, but a guy that you had also mentioned to us was a guy by the name of Jordan Tutu. You had a pretty cool story. Um, and not only just because of, you know, a guy like Jordan Tutu, but I think when you go back to the roots of what it means, especially trying to grow the women's game or those men's hockey players, we had Spencer Meyer, the captain of the team on talking about his involvement in the community a Sartell native you know playing for his hometown Huskies um can you tell Jordan Tutu's story that you told us and kind of a, a really good lesson for uh younger players that are moving into the collegiate and professional world and things they can take away from that yeah such respect for uh for Jordan Tutu and kind of what he's gone through in his his own life and and uh, I think they're all very well known by anybody that follows hockey and and what he, what he's able to kind of come through and what he what he's done and but he's such a role model not just for that but then also how how he behaves when the cameras aren't on him you know in a positive way when nobody is really watching and, you know so there was a summer where you know I'd, I'd be working this one uh, th this youth hockey camp and there'd be a bunch of pro guys that would skate uh, skate before and and sometimes you help them out and but most of the time they they just want to skate and give give themselves a good workout in the morning and then get out of there and go golfing you know, or whatnot, but, you know, so once, you know, the youth camp, once all the little kids realize that there's these guys skating, you know, uh, before them, they get there a little bit earlier than usual, you know, and they'd have all their autographs, uh, their jerseys or whatever they wanted to sign all ready to go. And, you know, and some, some guys would sign it and other pro guys would, would sneak out the door, which, you know, it's fine. You, you don't know what they had going on, but, you know, one guy that really impressed me was Jordan Tutu. That guy, he would stand there and wait until every single kid that wanted an autograph got an autograph. Then he would search us down to, just to make sure he'd ask us, did everybody get an autograph? Do you guys need anything more from me? You know, do you guys, do you guys need help? And this is Jordan Tutu asking this, you know, just because he was just so invested in terms of the youth and being a role model to them. It was just so, such, such, so to see that, um, you know, really, and, and then also afterwards to hear all the little kids, because they don't say anything when they get in the autograph. They're like, Mr. Tutu, can you sign it? You know, he signs it, and then they scurry away, you know, but then their faces and how much they beamed up, you know, afterwards and just what that meant, you know, like I'll never forget the time I met Mark Nesky, you know, like again, getting his autograph, chasing him down a hallway in the West Edmonton Mall after their practice. And there's Messi, who now I sport his haircut, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, is this intimidating guy, you know, and he kneels all the way down to, I was at that time, I would have been what, nine uh, and uh, eight or nine. I can't remember exactly, but you know, he kneels all the way down to my level. He goes, Oh, what's your name? My name's Steve. And my dad's talking for me because I was scared as could be, you know, and he goes, signs, you know, signs, signs the hat, which I still have, have on my wall, you know, but like, it's just, uh, you just remember those moments. And for that fraction of a moment, how much of an impact that can leave on kids. And Georgian Tutu was one that made sure that he, you know, was a positive impact on any of those kids. So, you know, it's just a, it, it was a really special uh, moment of me seeing that and see how much that impacted the little ones. Steve, I got uh, one more fun question for you. I don't know if Noah has a little bit more, but I want to ask you how clear does your whiteboard look? And here's what I mentioned by that. I've got this guy with me. Yes, this is a hockey whiteboard, a pocket one I always carry with me. And so for folks, let's, let's do it this way. Let's do a simple three on two breakout. Now, in Miracle, they always did this, right, where Herb Bush is drawn up a play where you're trying to break out the puck here. Now, does this start looking like this every now and then where it starts to go like this? Or how clear is your whiteboard? And do people actually understand it after you actually draw some up on the whiteboard? Well, <laughs> Depends on what player you ask, you know, and sometimes you step back and, and you, I almost laugh at myself. I'm like, what was I drawing? What, you know, I was like clear as mud, you know, and yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, just thank goodness. There's some veterans that just tell the freshmen, don't worry, we know this one. You know? <laughs> and, and they're just, you know, and sometimes you'd be like, if you know what that meant, go in front. If you don't go to the back of the line you know so um, and, but and yeah that's, that, that's got to be what uh, the seniors do too is you pick out a freshman who doesn't know and you're like you're up first we're, we're, we've been here you go first you're going hey <laughs> you know I, hey my dad told me when I was younger always get in the front of the line you know unless you don't know what's going on then go to the second you know uh, <laughs> and then figure it out and then make sure you go but yeah you know that's 
it's 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 funny you mentioned the the dry erase board because that's something the hockey can I learned when I was little in terms of just how to properly draw. And I think some coaches don't realize how impactful that can be in terms of how clarity and Shannon Miller, Miller was an absolute stickler on it in terms of teaching how to be uh, how to deliver that content. <laughs> you know, so that was a lesson that that that, that I learned young, but then also <laughs> when I was at when I was at Duluth. So <laughs> yeah, there's some of them that just look like uh, uh, you know. So I'd, I'd say a work of art, but some people might argue. <laughs> yeah, I always loved uh, um, every time I would come downstairs to talk for the Chronicle too. Every time you guys would have plays up on the whiteboard, and I'm kind of some of them look. I would look and I'm like, oh, I get that. And other ones, I'm like, I got no clue what's going on here. Um, <laughs> do you have uh, speaking of which? Do you have names for all your drills too? Like we always, if people who are new who didn't know, we'd always call like one like the Islander two on one flow drill or like big wheel or stuff like that. Do you have names for every single one of your drills? Not every single one, the, the, the common ones, you know, like uh, Gibby's got one named after him, obviously Miller. I, you know, I got the Miller 2v1, you know, and uh, we got the Gibby flow. Uh, you know, we have a Johnson 3v2, you know, we, we have that, you know, and so, uh, yeah, we, we have a Cook 2v1 that's named after Dan Cook that's at Wisconsin, you know, so I, that I tend to name it after the player, like the Schuler back check. So Laura Schuler, there's a back check drill that I got from her. That's great. You know, Schuler back check, you know, I, I tend to name it after the coach I got it from. So hopefully I don't get too many from just one. Cause I, I guess a little confusing maybe, but yeah, yeah. I, I try to have a few names of it. And then uh, so other times we've just had the players name it, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, I think Janelle's boy called and named one uh, the twirling torpedo. <laughs> So, that's a new one yeah it's, it's a new one but i think i think colden uh named, named that one so he's like he, he's got his fingerprints all over that as well so is the gibby flow drill where you transferred to bemidji state or <laughs> oh, i won't have yeah. <laughs> I won't hey, he, he, he was uh we we saw him up in bemidji you know so to see him walk in with green on it's a little different we're like gibby and you know but he still bleeds red, you know, so he's still a Husky and uh, uh, just, you know, yeah, you have to have fun with him. I think that he's going to work for the Minnesota wild. Cause the only two colors that he's had were, was that uh, Christmas green and Christmas red. So I think you fit right in, in that wild organization. Uh, a couple of questions uh, more for you, Steve. Once again, thanks for joining us. Uh, maybe I'll ask you a little bit about uh, the women's team again. Cause I guess I hear you're like, you know, about them or something. Um, so uh, number one is because of the COVID situation, uh, one of the things that you were able to kind of do, but then kind of was off and on was actually the Husky Pups, which is where the women's team uh, jumps in and um, has that teaching moment, those Jordan Tutu moments, if you will. Uh, how important is that program? Can you talk a little bit about what that program does in the community and uh, how excited you're looking forward to having that program back in a uh, uh, full uh, Mike Gibbons flow, if you will? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, Janelle deserves all the credit for Husky Pups. And, you know, it's uh, so she she is the one that we, you know, we wanted to do it last year, didn't quite work out. And and this year we're like, okay, even with COVID, we got to make a run at it. And uh, she she did it, she did it all, you know, and she worked with community members, uh, you know, with the, with the local youth hockey organizations. And she she arranged the ice, she, she helped arrange all the programming, she arranged the volunteers, you know, and and uh, so she's just done a phenomenal job with that. But what, what, the, what the Husky Pups is, it, it's, it's an idea that we actually got talking about Bemidji. It's an idea we got from Amber Frickland, who's a former associate coach up there, you know, who's now a professor at Bemidji. But um, I think they called theirs a little lady lumberjacks, I believe it was. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole premise behind it is to provide an opportunity to introduce uh, young girls to, to hockey and uh, to provide them an opportunity where there isn't, um, you know, there isn't the barrier of uh, equipment or ice costs, or there isn't the intimidation of rosters or tryouts, or it's just meant to be a sustainable way to introduce uh, young girls to, to the sport, you know, but then at the same time, introduce our women to give them back to that next generation, you know? So, you know, it's, it's a program where uh, there's no charge, for the participants, it's it's free of charge, and and there's some phenomenal, there's some great donors within the community that that supported that, that paid for the ice and paid for the jerseys and paid for the little tags and you know and, and paid. I think they got uh, some Subway at the last uh, at, at the last one. We had a little jamboree at the end of the year here when we we're allowed to do things again, you know. So it's 
it, it is a really fun program. And, you know, all the conversations of a few of the parents and a few of the kids, I remember talking to this one dad and he goes, she's always wanted to play hockey. She's always wanted to try, but she didn't have equipment, but then she also uh, didn't really want to go to trials. You know, she didn't want to go trials or, you know, didn't have the, the time commitment. So this is just once a week, you know, and our goal is to do eight weeks. We did, obviously didn't end up doing all eight. Um, but, uh, you know, there were some of the girls that, uh, it's, this is their first time playing hockey, you know, and so, and there's some others, it wasn't, you know, it was the, maybe their, their second or third year and, uh, they're at one end of the ice and some of the others at the other end of the ice. And it's just, you know, so just talking with those parents and this, this gave them a very a non-intimidating environment where they can go. It's all girls expose them to the different social component, you know, that's involved in girls hockey and. And it's just all skills. It's all games. It's, it's fun. It's just, uh, you know, so Janelle just did a phenomenal job with that. And, uh, you know, and the organizers, they're willing to support it again. And uh, some of our donors, you know, that Janelle helped arrange and the, the community helped arrange, they're, they're willing to, to support it again next year. So that makes us really excited because this is something we want every year and, and to help grow girls hockey and, and within, within the St. Cloud community and the surrounding areas. And uh, just to give that opportunity, you know, and so, yeah, it was, it, it reminds you of why you kind of got into coaching to begin with. And it's just, it, it reminded you of, okay, that's why the smile on that kid's face, you know, or this kid's has that, you know, she's never played before, you know, so here's that opportunity for her. So it, it was really special and something that, that we definitely want to continue. Yeah, I'm not surprised Janelle uh, has her fingerprints or uh, paw prints for uh, Husky Pups, if, if you will, uh, all over that program. And it makes me think about when I was in college coaching as well, a uh, little bit of emotion, to be honest with you, and knowing how much of an impact you can make on some of those kids and uh, trying things that they may have never tried before in a sport that uh, requires a lot of coordination from what I hear. Um, Steve, I've got three more questions for you, so I'll try to be quick about them. Uh, to, to involve the women's team here, uh, one is actually because of the COVID situation normally, or in most years you get a chance to take that big road trip out east or kind of take a team trip somewhere niagara falls last year um one i don't think that happened this year um but number two uh do you have something special in mind or are you kind of thinking about maybe kind of going the extra mile a little bit next year uh trying to think of something uh extra creative to kind of make up for the lost year if you will yeah in terms of going out east yeah, or just a team trip in general, because you talked you've talked to us extensively about just how much a, a team bonding experience uh, of some sort uh, means to kind of take them and get their mind away from hockey a little bit, but still have uh, all the gals together. Yeah, you know, obviously this year presented a lot of challenges for us with travel, so you just try and find ways to, you know, we even tried to skate outside one time and it ended up being the ice was way too soft. Another another day it ended up being way too cold. One day, you know. It was like, are you kidding me? You know, so you try that. We went paintballing at the beginning of the year, you know, and uh, that, that was a blast for someone. That was hilarious. Um, but uh, so, you, so you, you try a few different things and you know, nothing can replicate, you know, just getting on the bus and getting on the road. And, you know, that was going to be Ohio State because we were going to bust Ohio State. But then obviously we couldn't go because of COVID protocol um, that, that year. So, you know, just for us, just the opportunity to jump in the bus and, and, uh, you know, I was grateful that the athletic department supported us so much in terms of being able to sometimes leave a day before and, and to be able to get that experience, um, uh, with, with our teammates. Cause again, that's, you ask the seniors at the beginning of the year, what, what do you want out of this year? This year is going to 100. So back in September, when we asked them, it's going to look different. You know, we all knew that, but what, what do you want out of this year? And that's before we even knew we could play games. You know, they just wanted the opportunity to compete. And they wanted the opportunity to, to build lasting memories with their teammates. So that's why we tr tried the COVID cup, which game started. So we got going with games, you know, so we had the COVID cup, we had the paintballing, you, you try some team activities as much as you can within COVID protocol, you know, but uh, you try different things on the, on the road in terms of getting on the bus and, and having that experience. Um, but yeah, nothing like a good long road trip, which hopefully fingers crossed we'll be able to do next year. And um, so, uh, you know, and, and hopefully next year it's, going to be more predictable in terms of what it's going to be and hopefully we're, we're able to jump on a plane and, and, and go out east and and because uh, there are a couple of trips planned so hopefully we get the opportunity to do those 
I'd sign up to shoot Steve uh, with a paintball. I don't know. Um, I also I also hear that uh, the announcers for the COVID Cup are pretty darn good in terms of the, the intro there. Uh, yeah, not bad. I, I hear that draft is still making waves in terms of what, what happened that draft. <laughs> yeah, putting St. Cloud State on the map, uh, one pick at a time, if you will. Uh, yeah. Speaking of team bonding here, my non-team-based question here, you told us a little bit story about a story about a time where you were actually trying to make the Dauphin Kings uh, and trying to have a little bit of team bonding, uh, maybe crossing over the line a little bit. Uh, um, I'm assuming you don't have fights in women's hockey practices, but uh, how about you on the men's side all those years ago? I, I, I had a few tussles in practice over my day, you know, but not a lot. I can remember two of them. One was in Dauphin. I was just a young pup and I might've started to cross the line a little bit in terms of physicality and practice. And the captain came over and just, you know, I'll say it was a light tap, uh, but it was, it was a light tap that uh, was a little scuffle. Uh, but then afterwards, he, you know, we talked and he goes, all right, kid, tap me on the head. Okay, we're good. And that was it. It was over. You know, it last all felt like longer to me. It was about probably only about 20 seconds. But, you know, so, uh, you know, that captain, he was great, you know, but he was like, okay, you know, there's that line. He just went over that line a little, a little bit. And that was a lesson learned as a little, little young pup. You know, and another one happened when I was at Lawrence, you know, is just, you just wanting to compete and wanting to get teammates better, wanting to get better. So you had a little tussle here and there, but afterwards you pat and then you're like, okay, we're good. You know? So, uh, yeah, that, that, that was Dauphin. Uh, I was in Dauphin for my year after high school. Yeah. Um, uh, Janelle and Molly Engstrom, maybe, uh, I don't know, that would be a pretty good tilt. I would say you got the range and reach of Janelle and then Molly's kind of got that speed and that quickness get inside of that reach. I think it would be a good one. Just kidding. We don't promote fighting on this show unless it's fighting North Dakota fans. You can still do that. Um, yeah, th th yeah, that's definitely okay. And then, <laughs> and then also quickly on Janelle and Molly, it's when they have to jump into drills, sometimes Ooh. they're, you can just, it still comes out of them in terms of them, their compete level. They just can't help themselves. <laughs> You know, and our players are like, oh my goodness. I'm like, well, there's a reason why they're both Olympians. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so it did, they're, they're phenomenal role models. So yes, you know, it, it comes out and comes out in all of us at different times. Speaking of the last question of compete here, this women's hockey team getting set for next season as they wait and watch the conclusion of the NCAA tournament this year, looking to continue to climb that ladder seventh last year, sixth this year, maybe looking for fifth, fourth, even third. Um, what do you expect from this returning group? What are you excited about uh, incoming freshmen? Do you kind of have a little bit uh, of know-how of what you might be getting and how excited overall are you for uh, what's coming up in this group? I see you taking a deep breath saying, how much can I reveal about this freshman group that hasn't been announced yet? So, uh, um, Steve, uh, overall, what are you excited about this group and what are your expectations? Yeah, well, again, like you said, just kind of building and, and climbing that ladder, if you will. And, and uh, you know, you mentioned that we, uh, we, we feel as though we could even finish higher this year. We, we left some points on the board. And, and the, again, the, the, that's a lesson that, you know, we take in the next year. You know, in terms of how can we make sure we, you know, inevitably there's always a season where you're like, oh, we, you know, we could have, would have, should have in certain games. There's always going to be that, you know, except for the team, one team, you know, every year is, is not going to think that. So you're always going to think that, but you just want that to be less and less and less each year. So, so for us, you know, obviously we took great strides and we have, we have a young team, you know, like I said before, over 50% of our team are, are underclassmen. And, you know, next year is a different year with the Olympic year as well you know, where, you know, some, some players will be, you know, for other teams will be gone for the whole season. And then other players will be gone for portions. Like for example, for us, you know, hopefully some of our players are able to make the Olympics and, and if they do the, they'll be gone for basically all of February, <laughs> you know, they'll come back right for playoffs and then that's it. You know, um, they'll be gone for portions of it as well in November. That, that's just part of it. We're proud of them to be able to do that, you know, so the next year we'll have some uncertainty to it as well. And some things that we just won't be able to predict. And, um, but that's just like any season. So I think for us next, next year, we're, we, we feel as though that we can still push that ladder even higher. You know, we have a lot of room for that. And, you know, a freshman coming in next year, it's a smaller class, you know, and uh, so uh, right now all defensemen, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're always actively shopping for more, if you will. So that, that might grow a little bit in addition to some of the seniors coming back, you know, that bodes really well for us is that we, we feel as though that some of the freshmen coming in, you know, they, they, they'll be able to really push some of our veterans for, for playing time, you know, that they'll be in that spot. Now they're going to have to earn it. Right. But you know, they, they're going to be in a position to be able to push, 
uh, push the, push that level higher. And, and that's what you want every year, you know, and veterans want that they want to be pushed, you know, and that's what true competitors want, you know? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a smaller group next year. Uh, but they're a group that, that we believe is bringing a really good character as well, you know? And, uh, and so it's, it, it, it's going to address some areas there that, that we, that we want that, uh, that's, that's really going to help us. And, uh, but yeah, so I think I answered your question. Yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, it, next year you always kind of get the rose colored glasses on. You always do. And, and, and this year we, we do, and, and, uh, we're excited for it. Head coach of the St. Cloud State women's hockey team, Steve McDonald. Thank you again for joining us. It was always been a pleasure and uh, we'll definitely have to catch up sometime soon. Uh, as always guys, appreciate the time. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve. If you're looking for more Huskies Warming House podcast content, there's a place for that. Visit us at huskieswarminghousepodcast.com and follow our Twitter page at Warming House Den for the latest news, notes, updates, prizes, and more. Don't forget you can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, and more. We also are on Google Podcasts and would love to hear your feedback on the show. Drop us a line at Husky's Warming House Podcast at Outlook.com or leave us feedback in the feedback section of the Husky's Warming House Podcast website. And finally, if you know any Husky's hockey alumni who would love to be on the show, let us know and we just might make it happen. Nick, always fun to hear from uh, anyone close to St. Cloud State Hockey. And it was really interesting, like we kind of had mentioned in the pre-show a little bit, just being able to kind of catch up with Steve on that more personal level. Not that we don't, you know, when we see him around the rink, but it's always nice to kind of catch coaches uh, kind of at their more relaxed because it doesn't happen very often. It's also weird to see Steve in his own personal home office instead of down at the rink or uh, somewhere around the Herbricks National Hockey Center. Uh Nick, as we are actually recording this uh, last Thursday, we don't have any information on what is next for the men's hockey season. The women's hockey season is done. Uh, so uh, for something interesting, before we let the fans go, Nick, uh, what big plans do you have coming up uh, for the summer? What are you doing for the summer, Nick? Let, let's, let's give the fans a preview of what they can look forward to. And Mr. Maxson is back in action in the sunshine months. Uh, so obviously the, you know, going into my final year with St. Cloud, there's a couple of, uh, you can call it the irons in the fire with uh, summer internships. I haven't, uh, been offered nor accepted one just yet. Uh, but uh, looking at a couple of different options, uh, some local here in the twin cities, some outside the twin cities, um, at the end of it, just trying to make the best of what I got for the last, uh, next, not last next 14 months. It'll be my last, uh, 14 months uh, that I'll be going to a uh, St. Cloud, but, uh, again, still plenty of work to be done. And, uh, definitely a lot of uh, Huskies hockey still to cover. So, yeah, it should be really exciting. Uh, it kind of crazy to think that St. Cloud state hockey uh, is coming to an end within about a month and a half here for both these hockey teams. And then we get ready for uh uh, season number two, quote unquote, officially of the Huskies Warming House podcast. We'll have it all for you here, as all of our followers know, but that will do it for episode number 53 of the Healthy Scratch interview segment. Don't forget episode number 54 of our regular Center Institute News and Notes comes back on Sundays, as well as our new Healthy Scratch interview the following Tuesday. Take care, everyone. <laughs>